Uh, thank you for being here. I'm very excited to be uh, in NAPSEC. This is my very first time. And well, um, I hope uh, you all are already recovered from the uh, bloodbath in Wall Street in the past few days. It was a massacre, right? But yet, here we are. Uh, today, we are not a uh, talk about the stock markets, the stocks per se. We will talk about security deficiencies uh, I found on software used to trade uh, stocks and other financial securities, right? My name is Alejandro Hernandez. I'm from Chiapas, Mexi Mexico, which is in the southeast of the country, next to Guatemala. I have been working for IOActive for more uh, than six years now, and I come from a purely computer sciences background. Uh, I myself taught in finance and a bit of economics and trading, and in the end I decided to bridge both topics because I'm interested in both, right? One day, uh, last year, I was trading with my application, and I asked myself, with the amount of money that many people have in, in their phones, in their uh, computers for trading, how secure are these technologies? Uh, I found out that many times we consider certain technologies by its nature, uh, we consider them secure until you dissect them, until you test them. And this is how I decided to do this uh, statistical analysis uh, on trading applications. This is how Wall Street looked like many years ago. And we passed from that to this. More computers, less people. And we uh, uh, inherit the, the risks involved, the risks that we all already know, right? Uh, it's also important to say that the valuable information and the attack surface on trading systems is different from those in banking, banking system, right? They are similar, but the information is slightly different and the attack vectors as well. Now, what is a trading software? Trading software allows you to fund your account via a credit card or, or you can connect your banking account and you can uh, buy or sell stocks, you can uh, keep performance, uh, keep monitor uh, of the performance in your portfolio, uh, receive market data, etc. And some of the most used platforms are uh, these ones, for example, TD Ameritrade, Charles Schwab, MetaTrader, uh, Yahoo Finance that used to be for market research only, but nowadays they allow you to connect your trading applications and uh, keep monitoring your positions. Uh, Robinhood, Coinbase for crypto, uh, Bloomberg Terminal, which is very expensive. It's uh, more than $20,000 per year per terminal. So I didn't have access to, uh, to test these, uh, these terminals, right? But still, I'm, I'm wondering how secure they could be. I don't know yet. Um, IQ option, Avatrade, et cetera. Probably many of you have seen this, um, this Netflix um, uh, series. This is Bloomberg Terminal. Um, I didn't have access to this one, but I had access to this one, which is, I, I think it's the Ameritrade, right? So let's go to the core of my research, the findings. What I did, I analyzed 16 desktop applications, you know, standalone applications, uh, that runs on Windows or, or Linux, 34 mobile apps, and 30 websites from these brokers. Probably many of them are familiar to you. Abatrade for crypto, uh, Bloomberg Capital One, Charles Schwab, Coinbase, eSignal, eToro, eTrade, ETX Capital, Fidelity, First Trade, Interactive Brokers, Markets.com, Merrill Lynch, which is a mix between Bank of America and Merrill uh, Lynch. Uh, MetaTrader, Oanda for Forex Exchange, Personal Capital, Robinhood, Scott Trade, the Emory Trade, Trade, Trade Station, and Yahoo Finance. Is there any uh, in the room that works for any of these companies? No? Well, lucky you. <laughs> okay, so. What I, uh, what I use for this testing, I use Windows 7, Windows 10, and iPhone 6, and the Android emulator. And what did I review in all of them? This, I review only the tip of the iceberg. These are the security controls for the different platforms. And as you can see, this is a very basic checklist, right? 
you know, looking for encryption in communications, encryption in storage, uh, password management, uh, password policies, hard-coded secrets, uh, biometric authentication, uh, root detection, uh, obfuscation, and in the website, the things we all know, right? The basic ones, cross-site scripting, uh, some security headers, etc. Unfortunately, I felt I was in 2010, 2012, in certain applications. Uh, I thought I was dissecting uh, dummy applications, honestly. This year, I felt back in time dissecting uh, uh, these applications because many of them, they were very insecure, and I'll show you in a bit. Now, the biggest concern is on encrypted communications. As you can see, 64 of the desktop applications, they send partially or fully, uh, or they, they have channels that do not encrypt the communication. So what is the problem with this? Attackers could intercept data or alter data, including your passwords, right? Or uh, the bid or ask prices for stocks. And the traders could trade based on misleading information, right? Uh, the protocol that is mostly used is HTTP and HTTPS, but however, there are a few other protocols that are particularly for this part of the uh, uh, finance industry. For example, FIX, which stands for Financial Information Exchange Protocol. Um, here, we can see a classic HTTP request. I'm sending an order to buy uh, this instrument and you can see clearly here your account number, the amount of money you are, uh, you are uh, buying, etc. This is another uh, clear example. This is Wireshark. This is a proprietary protocol. When you put your username and password and you log in, you can see the clear text password in something uh, that I think is a legacy protocol because you can see here the copyright message from 99. Data Broadcasting Corporation. So in my opinion, I, I don't know, in my opinion is, it was developed 20 years ago and it's still used nowadays in 2018. How is it that possible? This is e signal is a, a signal provider. As you know, on, 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 on trading, the ones who have the fastest information are the ones who get more money, right? They place uh, the trades quickly. Right? And this software is to receive market data on real time. And it's a paid service. You pay for it. It's a sub subscription, right? All right. Now let's talk about FIX. It was from 92. It's a standard, industry standard for trading and messaging. It's still widely used by exchanges and traders. And there are guidelines how to implement it properly, you know, through secure SSL tunnels, etc. And this is how originally looks. This is pure ASCII uh, separated by pipes, but as you can see, it's not encrypted. It's just a, a binary and ASCII protocol. Let's take a look. This is FX Pro. This is the API to receive prices and to trade. To trade, you have the endpoint over SSL, or if you choose, you can use the plain text protocol. Why not, right? Let's see a demonstration from Interactive Brokers, TWS. iBot is a robot assistant, so you can send voice messages or text messages to buy, to query uh, prices, etc. And it's interesting. This entire application uh, runs over SSL, over HTTPS, except iBot. When I send commands by voice, This is Wireshark. Oh, the sound doesn't work, but I said price of Netflix, and I sent a command. So I get the Netflix price, and then I said, buy 100 shares of Netflix at market price. And in the end, I send the order to buy the stocks. Submit order. And there you, there you go. Everything works, etc. But what happens 
in the communication. When we see this on Wireshark, Wireshark has a basic fixed dissector, a basic parser, and you can see in raw data, you have a JSON string with all the user input, which is my voice. So you can see if I ask, for example, I don't know, for balances, for, for I don't know, whatever I say to the robot, it's, it's traveling in clear text, which is really bad. Here we see another example of my positions, which is my portfolio. It should be secret, right? But still, it's being sent um, over this protocol, partially unencrypted. This is another one. This one, interestingly, has the SSL button at the login page. It shouldn't be by default, right? We all know what the SSL stands for, right? We are tech savvy. What about those uh, financiers that have no idea what SSL is? It's like, well, if it comes by default disabled, I won't touch it because I have no idea what it is, right? Still, even if, even if you enable SSL, every uh, couple of hours, as far as I remember, this application used to send uh, diagnostic logs in non-encrypted channel our HTTP, they use SSL, but this log has a lot of information, your balances, your positions, how many stocks you buy, how many stocks uh, you, you sold, etc. This is another one, Charles Schwab. Your watch list, your portfolio, clear text. This is another one, IQ option. This one is interesting. Everything goes over HTTPS except this particular request. Probably one of the developers forgot this request and this one goes over HTTP unencrypted. So all you need is the SSID to hijack the session. Now, another problem from the 90s is still prevalent nowadays is denial of service. As you know, availability is one of the most important things for a trader. You need your trading application or your trading app right in time to send the order as, as soon as you can, right? If the application doesn't work, it's you, lose a, you, you can lose opportunities on the, on the market, right? What's happening here? Developers and we are still committing mistakes from the 90s when it comes to, oh, to TCP sockets. Let's see. This is TD Ameritrade's Think or Swim. It has a TCP orders server that listens on the port 2000. So when I connected to this port, uh, the server didn't recognize my, uh, my language, right? So I looked for this string, syntax error, on the reverse engineered um, Java application. I found the error message, I tracked down to see what was parsing this application. This is basic reverse engineering. Huh? So after a couple of hours, reading the parser, you can see some of the uh, accepted syntax, some order types such as limit, markets, cost, you know, some keywords. And this is how the order server accept the messages, order for Netflix. So what I did was a small code to create a, an order attack, and you will see why. The TCP server doesn't have a limit for connections, and whenever you send an order to this server, there is a pop-up shown in the user interface. So if I automate this attack, this is, this is something I call TCP, uh, so, sorry, order pop-up attack. When I launch the attack, this is what the trader sees. This is the pop-up, and I'm sending a pop-up every second. It's impossible to use the application. The trader won't be able to do anything in the application because the focus is in the, in the order confirm dialogue, right? Plus, 
the application trigger a null pointer with reference here in Java. And with this problem, we have another problem because with this null pointer exception, there is a troubleshooting report, which is a zip file that contains a screenshot of the user interface. And this screenshot might contain sensitive information, my positions, how much money do I have, etc. like this one, screen zero dot PNG. This one is sent to the developers. Do the, do the developers really need how much money do I have invested to fix a null pointer ref? This could be another privacy issue, right? Now, it was a denial of service because the, the, the trader was not able to use the application, right? Let's see another denial of service on eSignal. So I have a JavaScript that creates many connections to the local host port. So this is a malicious web page, right? So if I send to the trader, hey, look at this, and the trader clicks on this malicious link, he's like, hey, do you really know what's going on while you're reading this? In JavaScript, I'm creating thousands of connections. And there is this point of no return. The application basically crashes. Since this is a signal provider, the other applications that are connected to this provider are not able to retrieve any market data. So this is another denial of service problem. And still we are committing these kind of problems from the 90s. What should be done? Timeouts, limit the number of connections. Now, let's move on to another interesting stuff. This is not a bug, seriously, this is, this is a feature, and this is by design. Trading programming languages supporting DLL imports. They allow you to create your own uh, trading robots, your own indicators for advanced charting and other things. The thing is, these languages are, uh, they, they come from other languages we know, such as C++, C Sharp, Pascal. Some of the applications restrict DLL imports, some others don't. So what is the risk here? The risk is if you download a malicious chart, which is a basic uh, block of code, this chart could have malicious uh, code, right? And again, if the f traders are not tech savvy, they have no idea of what DLL is or you know what I mean? So let's see the risk of it. This is NinjaTrader, and I basically uh, popped up calc.exe. Now let's see a realistic backdoor for MetaTrader, which is used by millions of people out there. This backdoor is disguised as an Ichimoku indicator, which is a Japanese indicator for, uh, for, ch for technical analysis. So this is MetaTrader, these are my charts. This is the programming language. Here you can, you know, create triggers based on prices, based on uh, certain patterns you see on prices, etc. In this case, take a look carefully. I'm importing the Ichimoku Cloud library, shell32.dll. When I start the indicator on init, I'm drawing the cloud and I execute this. I obtain the cloud from Ichimoku clouds.org. You know, it's a base 64 encoded something, right? We understand that, but many people in the finance industry have no idea uh, what, this, what this is. And in the end, I just draw the, the, the cloud. Let's see how it works. This is a chart from Euro USD, and I drag the Ichimoku indicator here. 
Here is a trick, allow DLL imports. This is the only software that warns you. It's like, if you allow DLL imports, it could be dangerous, right? But who cares, I want money. I have seen many tutorials on the internet that show you step by step how to download the indicator, do this, do that for trading robot and you will make money. And many people do that, right? If I were a financier, it's unlikely that I understand what DLL is and the risks involved. Now, when they click accept, all right, there we go, this is the cloud. It's a fancy cloud. But what's happening in the back? We connect remotely and this is a backdoor. Now I have control of the trading system because I'm more malicious plugin. This is another risk. And it's interesting because it's not a bug. As I said, this is a feature that they give you. I think, in my opinion, there should be uh, a, a more visual warning. It's like, are you sure you want to allow shell32.dll? Are you sure you're calling external programs, etc.? Okay, let's move on to unencrypted stuff, passwords. This is the most important thing, because if the attacker have access to your password, they can log into the website, to the, to the platform uh, in web, username, password, two-factor authentication is enabled, but it's supported by most of the traders, but it's not enabled by default. So if an attacker steals your password, they can log in, they can connect a new bank account, they can sell all your positions, sell all your stock, move that liquid money, that fiat money to the bank account, remove the link, log out, and that's it. So this is the importance of passwords, right? The problem is that in 21% of mobile apps, the password is stored unencrypted. And in 21% of desktop applications is are unencrypted as well. As you can see, desktop applications are the most insecure ones. I don't know why. I think it's because we are we come from, the, from, from uh, these applications started in web, right? Web platforms. Then we moved to the mobile apps, and then we needed more sophisticated tools, more uh, more advanced charting, more advanced trading, and they created these thick applications, the desktop applications. But in the end, they were like, well, it works, whatever. They are not enforcing the security properly there, and we'll see. How do you extract? passwords or any other data from a, from a mobile phone, well, you just do a develop cat on Android or in, or in iOS, you just dump the, the, uh, the log file from the console, or you connect it to USB and you extract the information, right? It's straightforward. Now, let's see. This is ETX Capital, username, password. This is the login console. We have two problems here. They are sending the password in the login console, and they are sending the password as a GET parameter. And as you know, sending sensitive information in GET is not a good practice, because this could be stored in, um, in browsers, in proxies, in load balancers, etc. Another one, user login in plain text, user password in plain text. This is stored in a configuration file in the phone. Another one, this is plus 500, change password. The new password is plain text, plain text. Base64 is not encryption. This is money.net, this is a paid application. And this is Base64. This is an XML file in, on Windows. In the, it's easy to, to find, right? Coinbase. Whenever you enable an extra layer of security, setting a pin for unlocking your application, well, this pin is stored in plain text, and it's Coinbase. This is IQ option. I reported this one last year. This is a clear text password. They fixed it. Now the password is encrypted. But when you enable two-factor authentication for an extra layer of security, I don't know, for some reason, they are storing the clear text password again if you want to be more secure, well, you open a backdoor, basically. 
another one, and another one, and another one. Uh, this is only a tip of the entire research. In the end, in the slides, you will find the white paper, and there you will find thousands of screenshots and more statistics and more names, more uh, brands, etc. Um, another problem related to password is passwords is trading data stored and encrypted. I don't want people to know how many, how much money do I have uh, invested, right? How many positions I have on Tesla? How many posi positions I have on Apple or Amazon, etc. This information is, should be known only by the owner of the stocks, right? The problem is that 70% of desktop applications store data unencrypted, and in mobile apps, almost the half of the applications I tested stored trading data unencrypted. What is trading data? How much money do you have invested? How much money do you have in cash? Your portfolio, your personal data, your orders to buy, to sell, your watch list, symbols, and any other related data. Let's see, portfolios. For solar, HSBC, you see here the, the company's names, the positions. This is, this is Yahoo Finance. Whenever you link your trading account to Yahoo Finance, you could see your number of, of, of shares and the price, the symbols, everything in a big JSON unencrypted. Uh, we have worked closely with Yahoo to fix it. It's another one, net cash, etc. portfolios, personal data. When you fund your account with a credit card, like in this case, the name of the credit card and other data is uh, stored on encrypted on markets.com. This is Oanda for FX. This is a funny one because the developers, they <laughs> were creative enough to create a nice ASCII art for the orders box. You can see a fancy ASCII art. Still, it's stored unencrypted and they have how much money you, uh, you invested, right? This is Charles Schwab and many more. Now, related to passwords, password policies. Some brokers, such as these two, allow you to choose one, two, three, four, five as password. Or some others, they limit your length. The password you enter is too long. Please choose 12 or less characters. Some of them validate the, the, the applications client side only not server side, et cetera. Authentication problems. As I said before, most web application, applications support 2FA, but it's not enabled by default. And desktop applications, they do not implement 2FA. 24% of the mobile apps do not implement fingerprint authentication. Even if the phone supports the, 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 the fingerprint, they do not enable it. They do not implement it. This is another prevalent problem. The session is still valid after logout. This is a very common problem in web applications, not only on trading applications, in general purpose uh, applications. You click the logout button, and for some reason on server side, the session is not destroyed. I see it every week in every application. I don't know how, why, why is it hard to kill the session in both sides. Um, for example, on E-Trade, which are big names, E-Trade, Charles Schwab, Fidelity, Yahoo Finance. Uh, they fixed it already. They had this problem. I'm logged out. I sent a previously uh, uh, request, and I was able to retrieve data. E-Trade, you have been logged off, but on Burp, I sent a previous request, and it worked. Charles Schwab, they had the same problem, too. When it comes to web as well, HTTP, we all know the good security countermeasures, right? The flags in session cookies, HTTP only and secure flag. Half of the applications, they do not implement these, these attributes on their session cookies, and they are really important, right? As well as HTTP security headers. 
most of the applications, approximately 70 uh, 70% of the platforms, do not implement all or any of these headers: strict transport security, CSP, etc. The classic ones, we have them for breakfast, cross-site scripting. And we have many other problems, privacy modes, hard-coded secrets on reverse engineered applications. For some reason, developers love to leave their private keys, internal IP addresses. When it comes to desktop applications, Apparently, they never heard of anti-exploitation mitigations, ASLR, DEP. Most of the applications do not implement these, these flags for desktop applications, nor for Linux. 32% do not validate SSL certificates, and we can continue with the list of problems. As I said before, you can see a report with more detailed uh, uh, results in this link. This is the white paper. I invite you to take a picture of, of, of this. There you will see more statistics, more screenshots, more names of companies. And now, we have another, an interesting problem. This is a high level problem. Uh, I tried, we tried to reach the companies, and the first problem was we didn't find a a main point of contact to report security vulnerabilities. All we had was, you know, support at company.com. We sent the reports with this information timely, and most of the companies, they never replied. Only the big names, such as TD Ameritrade, Schwab, Yahoo Finance, Interactive Brokers. I think it's because you can see a basic correlation between the amount of money they invest in cybersecurity and how responsive they are. They were very responsive. A couple of days, or the same day, we sent a report, they were, oh, thank you so much, let's work together to fix the vulnerability, as we did with Yahoo Finance and Interactive Brokers and the other uh, uh, two. But the rest of the companies, they, they never replied. So this is why I waited until Black Hat a couple of months ago to, um, you know, to full disclosure this. Now, I have two topics for you, probably, I didn't have time to develop these ideas. I consider this could be, uh, this could be interesting for the research. Social trading risks. There are risks on social media nowadays. Trading on fake news, trading on uh, uh, misleading information on social media. We are very connected. Even the stock exchanges are connected with the people now. NASDAQ, the NYSE, uh, NYSE everything is connected on social media now, nowadays. For example, there is a technology named sentiment analysis which is a metric to measure the acceptance or rejection of certain uh, instruments, certain stocks. For example, Nintendo, you go to the social signals and you will see the indicator here, the sentiment. 73% of the people is talking good about Nintendo and they are talking about Pokemon, Nintendo, Nintendo Go, Go and you can see some selected tweets here. I'm not sure if there is a person selecting these tweets or is is, is a computer, it's an algorithm. So I think it would be worth watching at these algorith algorithms. How easy it would be to bypass these filters to, um, you know, to control the price of, the, of, of, of an asset, etc. Another thing, trading on misleading information. Do you remember the PGP vulnerability last year, I think? So this company, there is this company, PIMCO Global Stock Plus, that their symbol on the stock market is PGP. So when the vulnerability was public, the price plunged. After a few minutes, they realized, hey, wait a second, this is PGP encryption software. It's not our company. Let's buy back. And many people did a lot of money in this bull market and bear market, right? It's interesting how the social media could impact in, in, in these uh, things. Another idea, trading protocols. Today, I show you HTTP, HTTPS, and FIX. But FIX is only one of many different protocols that are implemented in the stock mar markets and, other, and many other um, institutional investors. 
how secure are these protocols? Have they been fast? Have they been tested? Have they been passed through a code review? I don't know, I don't have access to this. So this is basically a wake up call to the FinTech industry in charge, in charge of this to test their protocols. The regulators, what do they say? The SEC, the FINRA, SIFMA, I didn't find anything related to trading for secure trading, you know, guidelines to FinTech companies or at least a checklist. Uh, like, hey, if you're going to develop a trading software, a trading application, not only for retail, or also for uh, institutional investors, do this at least. Or they should take place and say, hey, you know what? I'm going to audit your applications. I don't know. Another thing, rating organizations. There are organizations that score the brokers from one to five stars based on different um, concepts, commissions, research, education, how easy to use, but I don't see security in here. I think there should be another column that measures the security, at least to mention, hey, this is secure because they implement 2FA, they implement uh, fingerprint authentication, they implement a good password policy. I think there should be an accolade right here, but we are on the way. Recommendations for you guys. Enable all the security mechanisms in your software, and to the firms, to all the financial institutions. First, analyze your platforms, that's evident. Uh, secure design, secure programming, and importantly, audit your applications, not only internally, also by third party companies. I have been, it's, I have been working as a developer and as an auditor, as an internal auditor, and it's easy when you are, when you are familiar with the technology you know the processes, and when you audit your own applications, your in-house applications, it's just basically a checklist, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. But if you call someone else to think outside uh, of the box to see the problem, it's like, hey, hold on. They could, could give you a, a, a better insight on this. I have seen it many times. So firms, financial institution, is strongly recommended to call someone to take a look at your applications. And I think I run out of time. And thank you very much for your time. And uh, last thing, uh, people in the field or any other people interested in this topic, if you have any question or you want to discuss more about this topic, uh, are you active? We are throwing a lunch reception now. We can, you can join us now for lunch next door in McCormick's restaurant downstairs. Do you know it? Yeah, feel free to join and we can discuss more uh, about this. Thank you so much.